I'm going to talk about kind of looking at polynomials as an abstract vector space and kind of why this is interesting and like how this can help us understand linear algebra better. I'm going to talk a bit about the methods course and kind of how a linear algebra steps can really help you kind of understand that course a lot better. I'm going to talk about dual spaces, how to actually think about them, why we care about them, and like what the right intuition to have for dual spaces is. And if I have time, I'm going to go through a more miscellaneous section of just going through the big difficult proofs in this course and trying to like really understand them and break them down. So, okay, so first off, um, and oh, just a show of hands, who was at my previous talk? Uh, cool, that's mostly most people, so I'll just kind of make brief comments whenever there are points where I'm like relating something to the previous talk, but for the most part they should be pretty self-contained, so don't worry. Um, okay, so first off, um, to my first chapter, I'm going to be kind of studying polynomials as a vector space in depth. So uh, another question I'll ask is like, why am I doing this, and why is this worth the chapter? Um, I think this is like a really worthwhile thing to do, and I'm a bit sad it's not really done very deeply in the Linnard course, because I think polynomials are in some sense the first time you encounter a vector space, where the way to think about it is not just this is R to the N wearing a fancy hat, because polynomials have lots of like deep additional structure, like you can multiply two polynomials together, they're functions. Um, you can kind of give an, give an input to get an output out. You can look at roots and things like that. And I think that the, this additional structure kind of combines to mean that the right way to think about polynomials is not just as being like R to the N in a fancy hat. And so I think looking at them in depth can teach us a lot of important lessons about linear algebra. Um, um, so, and just to kind of emphasize what I just said. Um, like you can think about a polynomial as just being R to the N, or R to the N as the case may be, because if you have a degree N polynomial, like you can you can quite easily map this to a N plus one dimensional vector. You just look at the coefficients. Um, like this is clearly a bijection. Um, but I think that this is not like a very, this is not a very insightful way to think about polynomials because, for example, multiplying two polynomials together, this just doesn't multiply in any nice way. You get some ungodly claptrap about a zero times b zero, b zero times a one plus a zero times b one, and it's just a mess. So, I'm going to try and talk about how you should actually try and understand, them. and on the way, I'm going to like touch on a few of the results of the numerical analysis course and the methods course, and point out how they're really lovely from a lin linear algebra lens. So, first off, we are studying, um, and henceforth, P subtract N is going to denote the vector space of degree at most N polynomials. So, lesson one, we want to think about, this is a vector space. So the first thing we should always do with a vector space is think about a basis. and. So first question you ask is, what is a natural basis of the space of polynomials? And the obvious answer is one x, x squared until x to the n, because you know, there are these are the like, monomials where we're taking the coefficients, this seems an obvious basis. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that there are an infinite number of natural bases for the space of polynomials. And the kind of key takeaway I want to get from this is that bases are just a lens you lens you look at a vector space through, and this lens is fundamentally arbitrary. Like on a vector space, there's no god-given basis that we're supposed to be looking at. It's just a way to interpret the structure and understand it. And case in point, to understand a, a particular polynomial. Um, you could understand the look of the coefficients, but I think that another really important thing about polynomials is their functions. And the way to understand a function is by thinking of it as a magic input-output machine. And so you want to understand it by looking at its output. And polynomials have this really cool property that um, 
if you know what a degree n polynomial is at n plus one points, that exactly determines a polynomial, and you can choose that freely. Um, I'm hoping this is a property people are pretty familiar with. And if you've done Olympiad maths or the numerical analysis course, you'll have seen an idea called the Grange interpolation, um, where you can define a box like n points I want to bound it a function of a zero to an. I tap, I let, and I want to have a statement. I want to know what my function, what my polynomial is at each of these n plus one points. And the kind of standard way you're taught to do this is to take like a magic sequence of polynomials, um, where you take the product of j equals zero to n apart from i of this thing. So this is a degree n minus one polynomial, uh, sorry, a degree n polynomial. It's got a root at a0 until an apart from a1, and at a1 is equal to 1. So this is kind of, and you can just construct q from this by taking q equals um, the sum of bi times r of x, because if you put in any particular input, the ri basically act like delta functions. You get the right output. But I think there's a much nicer, more linear flavored way of looking at this. And I will try and convince you that this is a really natural basis to look at. Because, again, polynomials are functions. And you get a cool linear map when you try and look at these functions of, I want to map my, I want to take a map from pn to r to the n plus 1, where I take a polynomial and I evaluate it at n plus 1 points. And this is, a, this is a linear map. Like if I add two polynomials together, their outputs add together, if I scale them, the outputs scale. And it's also an isomorphism because these spaces have the same dimension. And if this is all zero, then um, the polynomial has n plus one roots, so it's a zero polynomial. And all the Grosch interpolation is doing is saying, I've got an isomorphism between these two spaces. I'm going to take a base, and this space has a canonical basis. Like, the basis is just the one in the first position, zero is everywhere else, one in the second position, zero is everywhere else. And so the way to understand this space, we have an isomorphism between it and the space we understand well. So let's take a base of the space we understand well, and look at what that corresponds to. And that's exactly the Lagrange interpolation basis. And drawing back to my kind of high-level point about bases are arbitrary, this is a natural way to look at a space of functions, but these n plus one points we picked were just completely arbitrary. There was no simple way to choose them. And any way of choosing them gave us this basis. And so the lesson I want to take from this bit is just bases are arbitrary. And also that the Gaussian interpolation is just, you have this isomorphism to a space in this really nice way. And it's just, what does the basis of the output space correspond to? Um, Lesson two, um, inner products. So again, when we're looking at r to the n, um, there's kind of one sensible inner product, the dot product. You just multiply all the coordinates together. The standard basis is an orthonormal basis. This is just like a really, really nice inner product. And in the course, you talk about how inner products are arbitrary. Like you have matrices inside the bilinear forms, um, and you can make the matrix whatever you want. but Personally, I've always found that feels a bit artificial. But again, with polynomials, we have a range of kind of interesting and natural bases. Uh, sorry, a range of interesting and natural inner products. So again, if I want to interpret it as r to the n plus one and take the inner product there, I could define the inner product of two polynomials as the sum of the products of the coefficients. But I think this is a bit of a dumb inner product because kind of nothing nice comes out of this. Um, and I could again take something through this lens and I could define the inner product of q dot r as 
to some evaluation of these bumps. And I think, and this is a perfectly natural and useful inner product. And again, these points are arbitrary. Or I could just treat them as functions and think about what I know from the method tools. A standard inner product between two functions is you take the integral of their product between any two points. And again, this is like a perfectly sensible and natural inner product to take because these are functions and this is how you study functions. And the endpoints here are arbitrary. There's not any kind of canonical way to choose endpoints of this integral. Um, I can even go full methods and include a weighting function in here. And again, that weighting function is arbitrary. And there are a bunch of settings where choosing different weighting functions can be really helpful and useful. Um, so yeah, to round off, inner products are arbitrary and polynomials kind of demonstrate this properly because the inner products that are meaningful, the inner products that look at the outputs of our function, don't have a kind of standard God-given way to interpret them. And whenever you're doing anything interesting with polynomials, see all of numerical analysis chapter one, the kind of first step should always be choose the inner product that best fits the problem. And to illustrate this, I'm now gonna talk in a bit more detail about what you can actually do when you have a particular inner product. With polynomials and try to engage a bit more with like what numerical analysis actually does. With so okay, so now we're gonna study the case where we actually have an inner product. Um, for example, I could find the inner product of two polynomials. Um, say r to q as the integral from minus one to one of r of x times q of x. Um, and hopefully it's pretty clear to people that this is actually an inner product, like it's linear in both of these things, and if you if r is equal to q, the only way this is zero is if it's a zero polynomial. I'm not really gonna prove that, but hopefully people are convinced that's true. And now we can get a cool thing out. Um, so one one thing I haven't really engaged with when it comes to polynomials is polynomials are a ring, like you can multiply two polynomials together. You have this notion of degree. And from a like linear algebra lens, this manifests as a bunch of nested subspaces because polynomials of degree at least zero, i.e. constants, are a subspace of polynomials of degree minus one of this polynomial degree of minus two, all the way up until my actual space. And each time the degree goes up by exactly one. And we have an inner product we care about. We have a bunch of nested subspaces. What should we do? We should choose an orthonormal basis where the span of the first k things is the k nested subspace. Um, we know exactly how to do this. We use Steinitz to take a basis of this thing. Each time we can extend it with a base to a basis of the next base by adding a single extra element. And then we can apply Gram Schmidt to make that all orthonormal. And what's a, what's a simple soft basis? You could just take one x, x squared, x cubed, until x to the n. And so you can apply the process I just outlined to get what you call orthogonal polynomials in numerical analysis. They're just the k the k orthogonal polynomial is q k is this thing minus where you just knock off all of the components of smaller polynomials and and this is a kind of lovely basis to look at because this is orthogonal to the entire subspace beneath that. So we now have a polynomial that's orthogonal to every polynomial of strictly small degree. And I'm going to talk a bit later about problems where this kind of inner product is actually useful and meaningful. And this kind of thing is going to be really, and having this basis is going to make that kind of thing a lot clearer. And just to kind of emphasize when you actually calculate orthogonal polynomials in numerical analysis, 
All you're doing is applying Gram Schmitz. Um, so just to take one result from the numerical analysis course that I think becomes very cool from the Linage lens, um, I want to study an inner product where multiplied by x commutes between the two sides of the inner product. So, for example, that is very true in this case. If you have x over here, or you have x over here, it's exactly the same thing. And there is this massive family of inner products that look like integrate something. Um, or indeed, this inner product, multiplied by x still commutes between the two sides. And cool fact is that in this, with an inner product like this, you, you have a three-term recurrence relation to get the to get each orthogonal polynomial. Like you don't have the, this sum where there's k different terms in it. All of the terms beyond a certain point can be made to be zero. And from a kind of algebraic lens, um, this is quite easy to see because when I want to find QK, rather than looking at x to the k and knock off components, I can instead look at x QK minus one and knock off components. This is a polynomial of degree k. So I knock off components a smaller degree. I still get the orthogonal polynomial of degree k out. But now, when I dot with something, this is a polynomial of degree r plus 1. And so if r plus 1 is strictly less than k minus 1, then this is just 0 because this is orthogonal to all smaller polynomials. So if I write out the recurrence relation, all the terms around a certain point vanish. But that's not a very satisfying explanation. So let's try and think about why this actually happens from the analogy lens. So this, this statement I made over here about multiplying by x commutes between the two sides of the recurrent of the inner product. Um, this should look really familiar. This is saying I have a linear map that is self-adjoint. I can move it between the two sides of the inner product. So I wanted to find a linear map that takes in a polynomial and spits out the polynomial times x. And what I've just seen here is that this polynomial is self-adjoint. Um, this means that the matrix, when I write it in my orthogonal basis, is going to be symmetric. And let's think about what the matrix of this map would actually look like. So each column is a polynomial of degree k. Like this is a constant thing, this is a linear thing, this is a quadratic thing, etc. And so if I multiply by x, what I get out is something that is degree at most one better, or exactly one better. So if I look at the diagonal, then I'm going to have a non-zero coefficient one below the diagonal. But then everything beyond that is going to be zero. And it's symmetric. So the fact that everything below the diagonal is zero, uh, everything more than one below the diagonal is zero, means everything more than one above the diagonal is zero. So my matrix looks like a bounds matrix. And so it makes perfect sense that I get the three term recurrence relation because there are three terms in every column. And did that make sense to people? Um, there are some subtleties I'm glossing over. So like, if you have to prove this in an exam, use that proof, not this proof. But this is what's really going on deep down. Um, and so just to recap the kind of reasons polynomials as a vector space are interesting unless we can get them. Um, bases are arbitrary. And I think polynomials demonstrate this a lot better. In a product are arbitrary. And that's why every time you look at a linear algebra problem, you should be trying to find the right basis and the right inner product to study it. And the key insight to think about polynomial ethics is that they're functions. And the way to study a function is by thinking this kind of a magic black box that takes inputs and gives you outputs. And that's the real structure of the rest of polynomials, not the coefficients. Um, OK, so now I want to kind of give a blitz overview of the methods course. Um, there's a lot of really, really deep maths behind the methods course, and I either have the time or knowledge to give it the treatment it really deserves, but 
I want to try and kind of highlight the right mindset to have with the methods course and the kind of intuitions behind all of the stuff. Um, this is very deliberately not going to be an incredibly rigorous chapter. So I, w I think the right mindset to have for trying to get things out of this is just like thinking about the ideas and what the right intuitions to have should be, rather than thinking about uh, like rather than trying to get caught up in like rigorizing every last detail. Um, if you want to kind of see the true beautiful maths behind all of the stuff in this course, I highly recommend the 30 courses analysis functions, linear analysis, and problem measure, which I gather rigorize a lot of the stuff I'm gonna like blot through and speed through very quickly. Um, but yeah. Ultimately, kind of the entire methods course is basically linear algebra in funky infinite dimensional contexts. And a lot of the ideas you use without really pointing this out, paying attention to it, are just like ideas from this course, but in a more interesting and useful setting. So first off, so the first problem you try and solve in the methods course is studying Fourier series. And Fourier series is based uh, literally just taking a change of basis. Like you have, you're studying periodic functions. So functions from the circle to the real line, um, or the complex plane as the case may be. And you take an orthonormal basis of these functions that looks like e to the i n x for n an integer. Um, and basically the entire point of Fourier series is just, this is an orthonormal basis under the inner product, f dot e equals the integral of conjugate of f x times g of x between like, say, zero and two pi. And so you've just got a function, you want to write it on this new basis, so you just dot with each basis element, and that gives you the coefficient. And that's the entire point of Fourier series. And one of the kind of cooler high-level math things to highlight here is we have a countable basis, which is like small, and this should feel weird because we're dealing with functions, and functions feel like they should be uncountably dimensional spaces because kind of each you, the circle is like an uncountable set. Surely each point can matter anything. And there's a lot of deep math we don't really understand. But I think the key point is that the circle is compact and Compactness is kind of a smallest property. And so the fact that my function is kind of differentiable in this like lovely compact domain is what makes it so nice. And that's why there's a countable basis. The next problem you want to solve in the methods course is, uh, not the next, but a highly related problem is looking at Fourier series, uh, Fourier transforms. And Fourier transforms are again just, I want to take a change of basis, but I'm no longer in this beautiful, lovely setting of, I have periodic functions, i.e. functions from the circle. Um, oh, sorry, is it clear to people why periodic is the same as having a function from the circle? Or would anyone like to explain that point? Cool. Um, yeah, so Fourier transforms. We're no longer studying these lovely things from a compact domain. And so we now have an uncountable basis. Um, we have e to the i kx for k any real number. And this is, and it's like, it should not be obvious how you should actually deal with an uncountably infinite basis. Like, you can't take a sum over basis elements anymore. And it turns out for deep measure theory reasons that the right way to think about this kind of thing is taking an integral. And so I want to think about f of x as being an integral over my new basis of some mysterious coefficient times e to the i kx. And the whole point of Fourier transforms is just, it's a way to get this thing out. Um, and one other thing I want to highlight here is, so an, the question you should, we're doing uh, linear algebra, so the question you should always ask yourself is what is the basis I'm currently studying? Like, so this is the basis of I want to convert to. What's my original basis? And in some sense, you can think of delta functions as being the natural basis of the space of functions, because the coordinate of my function f is like f of x. 
and I want my basis to have this lovely orthonormal property, where if I take like f dotted with my basis element, so delta x minus x naught, I want to get out the coordinates of that basis vector, and that's just that's like what the, how we define the delta function. That's the entire point of the delta function, and. Um, and so kind of from a certain perspective, the point of the delta function, why we define it, is so that it has this property that when you dot with it, you're just projecting onto that coordinate. And Fourier transforms demonstrate this because the Fourier transform of one basis element, like the Fourier transform of a delta function, is just e to the is just e to the i kx naught, like or e minus that possibly. And yeah, minus that. And so we've just gone from our original basis to a new to a new basis. And like that's all Fourier transforms are about. And the other cool thing to highlight about Fourier transforms is one of the reasons this new basis is so nice is that this is an eigenbasis of the differentiation operator. So Super important idea from thinking about methods from the Lenard perspective is that differentiating is just a linear map. It takes in a function and gives me out another function. And it's fairly clear, I hope, is just like a new function. And I hope it's fairly clear that like this is a linear map. And so the reason we care about these, one of the reasons we care about these is that the derivative of e to the i of kx is just i k times that. And so the reason we can solve differential equation with Fourier transforms is solving a differential equation, like say, plus f equals five or something. Um, solving this equation is really just inverting the linear map We just want to invert this map. And the way to invert a linear map is by choosing an eigenbasis. And so the point of Fourier transforms is it's a way to reframe the problem in terms of basis where differentiation operators are really nice. And like that's why you can solve differential equations with Fourier transforms. Um, so yeah, and the kind of lin out point to highlight here is that the fact that we had an inner product was incredibly vital at every point in this process because the inner product let us actually not just observe we had a new basis we could change to, but actually change to that basis. And in some sense, the reason we care about inner products in linear algebra is it's a tool to actually change our basis to an interesting new form. Um, because if we if we choose an inner product, our basis is orthonormal, we can just use the inner products to recover each coordinate. Um, and the other areas of methods where linear maps come up, where the other area of methods where you kind of heavily apply linear algebra is kind of studying in more detail this idea of differential operators on linear maps. You want to invert them, uh, or just kind of studying how to think about linear maps. Um, so first, I want to kind of do a proper example using polynomials. So in a purely finite measure case where everything is lovely and we understand it all perfectly. And then talk about how these ideas generalize. So let's solve Lagrange's equation. Um, that equation is so my goal is solve an equation that looks like this, where k is just a constant. And for deep physical reasons, it turns out to be interesting to look at polynomial solutions to this. And that's cool because polynomials are a finite dimensional vector space. So I can apply everything I know from this course perfectly. I don't have any of this hand wavy stuff going on earlier. And interestingly, we have a k here. k is a magic constant. And I want to figure out what that constant could be. So I'm just looking for eigenfunctions. Because I could rewrite this as 
Um, I want to solve the equation L of y equals a constant times y, where L of y is just this thing. And this is, and observe this is a linear map from the space of polynomials to itself, because if a polynomial has degree of most m, when you differentiate the degree goes up, goes up by one, when you multiply by x, the degree goes up by one, so it's kind of mapped the space to itself, and it's a linear map. And now the process of actually solving it is just applying ideas from this course in fairly straightforward ways. So observe that we can kind of look at this from a stern Lubel lens and factor this into being into having this form. Um, this is cool because this lets us define the inner product of the integral from 1 to minus 1 and by some kind of fairly straightforward algebra you can show that L is self adjoint in this inner product and this means that L is just a, like a self adjoint map with an inner product. So if you choose an orthogonal basis, L is just going to be a symmetric matrix in that inner product. And more importantly, we can choose an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions, or like eigen polynomials in this case. And then, and this is just, this is just the orthogonal polynomials for this product, uh, for this inner product. And so the way to solve this equation for polynomials is just find the orthogonal, orthogonal polynomials for this inner product use this inner product to write an arbitrary polynomial in that basis, and we now know exactly what this linear operator does. And this has the cool application that one context where we actually care about this equation and are only having polynomial solutions is quantum mechanics, solving the um, equation for angular momentum for the for a spherically symmetric potential. And we've just proven that there are like a we've just shown that there is like a discrete like set of things the angular momentum could be. It's quantized, and orthogonal polynomials have exactly found the states of like definite angular momentum. Um, and the key point in all this was we could phrase this differential operator as just being a linear map. And the way starting linear maps is choosing a basis where they're nice. So we chose an eigenbasis, and then everything was really easy. And the next, the second like half of the methods course is basically just doing this again and again. Like Stern Lubel in general is just doing exactly what I did here, but we have a countable, a countably infinite dimensional space rather than a finite dimensional space. And to emphasize again, we have a countable basis because Stern Lubel is studying a particularly nice subset of functions. Like things that are periodic, things that satisfy some really nice boundary conditions. And um, the kind of interesting difference between stern Lubel and Fourier series is we have a particular inner map, uh, we have a particular linear map, like say this thing, and we choose the inner product to fit that, unlike with Fourier series, where our inner product was just like given to us. And this again highlights the inner product are arbitrary. You choose them to fit the problem. And the reason we faff around with things like weight, weighting functions with stern Lubel is so that we can have it in a product where our function is lovely and self adjoint. Because if something's lovely and self adjoint, we can choose an eigenbasis. Separation of variables is just another example of this. You, again, assume some nice boundary conditions that give you a countable basis. And um, Separation of variables turns out to be a tool to construct a bunch of orthogonal eigenvectors. And these orthogonal eigenvectors sometimes turn out to be a complete basis. I don't really understand why that last bit's the case, but that's just a way to study and solve a particular kind of linear map. And 
drinks functions. Um, they're a kind of taking a different perspective on how to solve study linear maps. We have a differential operator, like say just um, like this, for example. And I want to figure out what y is given a force activity. This is essentially saying, I have a linear map, how can I invert it? And we know from the Lin algebras that when we have a linear map between two different vector spaces, like a function from B to W, the way to study it is to choose a basis where a B and a basis of W, where the matrix looks like this. And for inversible maps, um, we don't have the zeros, it's just the identity matrix. And Green's function is just doing this in the uncountably infinite dimensional case. We're dealing with uncountable, we're dealing with kind of general space of functions. We're no longer assuming nice boundary conditions. And so the natural basis for the output space is delta functions, because that's the natural basis for a function space. How do we invert on that? We just take the pre-image of each basis vector and take that as our basis for the original space. And that's all Green's functions are about. They just put a basis vector on this side, solve explicitly, this turned out to be easy for a bunch of reasons, and we can now invert our linear map. And yeah, so that's all I want to say about the methods course. Just to kind of recap the important ideas in there. Everything is linear algebra. Fourier stuff is all about just choosing the right basis. The way to study linear maps and try and invert them is just either find an eigenbasis or find a basis of the output space and kind of just take the inverse on each basis vector. And because it's a linear map, understanding basis vectors tells you everything that you ever need to know. And in a product of bases, are just tools we can choose to understand the setting of the problem better. Um, I'm going to take a two minute break here. And afterwards, I'm going to completely change tack and talk about dual faces in depth. And an exam tip worth highlighting with the method section is anytime you ever wanted to look at Fourier series, it is almost always a good idea to choose the basis e to the i nx rather than the sign cos basis, because when you take an integral with e to the i nx, there's exactly one case. When you take an integral we multiply by sign and cos, there are two cases, and so it's twice as much work. And I have no idea why Caulfield views of the sign and cos basis. Um, but the people in the room, I'm sure there are many who are taking methods to exam. And once again, I'll find the 2015 papers. Um, cool. I think I will begin again. Um, so now I'm going to change that completely and talk about some like in depth pure maths and linear algebra and talk about dual spaces, which were far and away the most requested thing on the things people didn't really get in the course. So what I want to try and highlight here are why we care about dual spaces at all. Like, why are they an interesting object? Why do we study them? How should we think about them? Like, what are the intuitions we should have for them? And what are the ways we can kind of actually solve problems with proving about them? Including how to, like, regurgitate all the proofs you better know for the exam. And then I'm going to try and talk about the kind of deeper maths hidden behind dual spaces, because I think that dual spaces are like actually by far the coolest part of the algebra course because there's a lot of really deep maths and structure hidden beneath the surface. So, first off, just a definition for anyone in the audience who's kind of forgotten or didn't go to the course or something. Um, wait, does anyone, anyone here not a Sephi and Mathmo out of curiosity? Ah, cool. Are you, um, are you a Mathmo? Yeah. First year, second, third year? Cool. Um, yeah, so. Dual spaces are just, I define B dual, which we're going to write as B bar. Uh, what was the notation Keating used in lectures? Star. Cool, I'll use a star, sounds fine. Um, yeah, so B dual is B star, and this is the space of linear maps from V to the reals, or whatever field we're using for our space. I'm going to look at reals because I like the reals. Um, and yeah, you could think of this as the space of one by n matrices, by n matrices. 
And this is a vector space because these are linear maps and linear maps are a vector space because you can add the, in, add the maps together by adding the outputs and scaling them up by scaling the outputs. So yeah, so like these have a clear vector space structure. And why do we care about them? So the case I want to try and like very strongly and emphatically make in this chapter is that the entire point of dual spaces and the entire reason we care about them is that dual spaces are like deeply and intrinsically linked to studying inner products and bilinear forms. Why? Because anytime you have a bilinear form, like say, oh, like the dot product, for example, um, we can, this is a kind of linear thing that has two inputs. And having two inputs is kind of complicated and messy. So another thing to do is say, what happens when you fix one of the inputs? And so I could think about that as like a linear, I could think about that as a linear map. Like I fix some vector C and I now have a linear map that maps W to C dotted with W. And so for any particular constant vector C I fix, my inner product naturally gives me a member of the dual space because this is obviously linear in W because it's a bilinear form. And giving in any W gives me a real number out. And so what I've actually just done is constructed a map from V to its dual. Because I can take C and map it to this thing. And this is an element of the dual space. And this is a linear map into V dual because this is a bilinear form, so it's also linear in the left element. And I want to argue that this is like deeply and intrinsically linked to dual spaces rather than just a mild curiosity, because given any map, it's not just the case that a bilinear form gives me a map from B to B dual. If I ever have a map from V to B dual, like given this, I could define a bilinear form as just, I take F of B. This is a dual vector, it's a function. So I can give it another vector as an input. So I just give it to W. And it's pretty clear that this is a bilinear form. And again, this is not just a curiosity. I'm going to try and tie basically everything I say in this chapter back to this core idea that the reason we care about dual spaces is because they naturally emerge from bilinear forms. And one way to try and understand bilinear form better is by studying dual spaces. Um, just say one example of kind of why the notion of fix one argument actually comes up and it's not just a random thing I've made up. Like um, inner products are a nice case of bilinear forms and they give up me this notion of distance of perpendicularity. So a thing I might care about is like the space orthogonal to a vector. And that's just the kernel of the dual map that happens when I fix V as one input to my dot product. Um, I'm going to say that again. W, a vector, is orthogonal to V if and only if the kind of resulting thing sends W to zero, i.e. And so the orthogonal space is just the kernel of the corresponding map. And I hope people kind of agree that at least this kind of object is something you've seen before and you care about. And another reason that this mindset is super useful is that, so V dual is a vector space and it's abstract. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really have the same natural structure that like a geometric a vector space like R to the N has that we can think about geometrically. And as with polynomials, the way to understand something like this is by taking an isomorphism to a space you do understand, V. And so, but I've just explained how an isomorphism from, like, an isomorphism, like, from V to V dual 
naturally gives me a bilayer form and vice versa. So, kind of the, the natural way to understand the dual space is by thinking about inner products and bilinear forms. Um, I should probably mention the reason I'm kind of using inner products and bilinear forms interchangeably here is that inner products are a nice case of bilinear forms. And in the case where it's an inner product, this map is non degenerate, uh, i.e., this map is an isomorphism rather than just being a linear map. And so I think inner products are kind of the interesting case here because I want to study this with an isomorphism, not with, say, a map where this gives the map everything to zero. Um, this mindset, I think, also motivates a bunch of the weird de weirder definitions with bilinear forms. Like, you define the rank of a bilinear form as um, the bilinear form looks like this thing. And you define the rank as A is equivalent to this matrix, R is rank. And this seems a bit weird for a bilinear form, like how do you interpret this? The reason you care about this is R is kind of, um, if you interpret this bilinear form and send us a map from like V to thing with a fixed input V, then the rank of this map is the rank of that bilinear form. And the map where you fix the second input um, and leave the first three has exactly the same rank. And the matrices of these corresponding of these maps, taking a like sensible dual base, which I'll explain a bit more later, is just A transpose or A. Um, because you can think of a dot with V a fixed vector as make V a row vector. So, and so the row vector looks like this. I'm thinking in terms of column vectors. So I take the transpose of this, which is just a transpose v. And so this linear map, when I take v and I get a row vector out, is just a transpose. And this linear map is just uh, a, because if I have a thing on the right, the vector I get out at the end is just a w. I don't need to do any work. Um, this also motivates things like left kernels, because the left kernel is a vector where you input, and then whatever you put on the right, you get zero out. This is a bit weird, but that means that the, the dual vector you get when you fix the left input is the zero. And so that's exactly the kernel of this natural map you get from V to V dual from that bilinear form. Um, yeah, and henceforth, I'm basically only going to look at inner products, but all of this does work with bilinear forms. It just inner products give me an isomorphism, and isomorphisms are nice. Um, did everyone kind of follow this link and this intuition and why it's important? Because like this is really fundamental. So please do ask if anything in that didn't make sense or could be cleared up. Cool. Um, please do stop me at any point if like something loses you because I think this is a really fundamental intuition and I don't think it's emphasized all enough in the course. Um, and kind of basically all of the results we care about for dual physics can be interpreted through this lens. So now I want to talk a bit about kind of in context outside just the linear algebra course, why are dual spaces interesting and useful? They're interesting and useful because, well, there is lots of contexts where dual vectors come up. Um, my two favorite examples are vector calculus and quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanics example, I'm not really going to go too in depth. The key idea is just, in quantum mechanics, when you measure something, what you're actually doing is you're projecting onto the eigenspace corresponding to that thing, because physical quantities are something with like a depth of energy, for example, is an eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. And the way to think about projection maps is just they're dual vectors. And so if you've ever seen notation that looks like this, like bra kind of notation, where this is a bra, this is just a dual vector. And if you do principles of quantum mechanics next year, which is excellent, the purest applied course I've ever taken, um, <laughs> you'll see this kind of thing everywhere. Um, yeah, if you've read Skinner's methods notes, he teaches that course. And it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. Um, I think a more interesting example is um, 
get to calculus. So looking at surfaces. So the objects we want to study are um, Um, the objects we want to study are functions from r to the n to r. For example, I'm going to look at xy to x squared plus y squared. I can define the surface as the solution to f of x equals the constant. For example, the solution to my particular instance of f equals 1 is just the unit surface. And I want to differentiate something, which means I want to look at it locally and see what happens. And as we know from analysis too, the way to study what happens to a differentiable function locally is to approximate it with a linear map. And linear maps are, um, so in this case, the derivative df is going to be a linear map from r to the n to r. And this is just a dual vector. Like, this is a linear map from R to the It's literally what the dual vector is. And as we know, the way to understand the dual vectors is by taking a sensible inner product and thinking about each map as being dot with some particular fixed thing on the left. Um, if you've ever heard the notion of think about dual vectors as row vectors, that's kind of why. A row vector, you can think of as just dot the, func the functional dot of that vector. Um, and so here, this is going to be dot with some particular vector, where the particular vector depends on x. And so geometrically, my vector is going to be some direction. Um, and coincidentally, it happens to be this direction. And locally, my function, the change in my function f is projects onto that vector, because this is a dual map, so it's a projection map. And I've defined my surface as where f is constant, which means the change is zero. So locally, my surface looks like the solution to like kind of where local changes are zero. So movements where the projection onto my vector is nothing. And that's just things perpendicular to my vector. And so Locally, I can just draw a line perpendicular to my vector, and the surface looks like that line locally, and like that's a tangent line. And in general, the reason that surfaces in n dimensions, which are differentiable and nice, have like tangent hyperplanes that are n minus one dimensional, is just this: the things when you project onto a fixed vector, you get zero out. Is just the plane perpendicular to that vector, and the local link is that. This vector is just grad, and like this is the only reason we care about grad and when we define grad at all. And if you look at the definition of grad in terms of the partial derivatives, and you think about the notion of like the actual derivative map in terms of the partial derivatives, like the change when you go in each direction, it should hopefully be fairly obvious that the like the vector you dot with to get this map out is just grad. And yeah, I'm not sure if analysis you ever actually mentioned that, but Grad is just applying analysis to ideas of derivatives and linear maps. Linear maps from R to the N to R are just dot with a particular vector. We call that vector Grad. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's why we care about dual spaces, and that's how to think about dual spaces. So, now I'm going to move on and like, actually do things with dual spaces, like prove the results of the course. And so there are two key ideas before we can actually start doing anything. Idea one is the notion of a dual basis. So the kind of as taught in the course, the dual basis says if I have a basis of B, like then there's a corresponding dual basis. One until fn, where if I take fi on like a linear combination of basis vectors, i.e., any vector in my space can be uniquely written like this, I just define that as the ith coordinate. It's so like I project onto the ith basis vector, and this is all like perfectly lovely and reasonable and works. 
rather fast. But you can, I think it's also easy to think about this in terms of the like inner product notion, because for any finite dimensional byte space, given a basis, we can define it in a product so that that's orthonormal. Um, like we literally just say, we just define it to be the drop product. You just take the coordinates and multiply them together and add them up. And in this, in this inner product, um, sorry, in this is an orthonormal basis of this inner product, at kind of by definition. And I now want to understand, I want to understand my dual space. So I want to figure out a simple basis to take. A simple basis to take is just dot with particular dot with my basis vectors. And so and that gives you exactly the same notion as project onto a particular coordinate. Um, in the kind of canonical case of R to the M, we just have the dot product. This is just saying a simple basis of the dot product is dot with the x-axis, dot with the y-axis, dot with the z-axis. And if you think about Grandin's coordinate form, that's what we're doing over here. And yeah, so um, another way to think about this is dual spaces are just the base of linear maps. They're one by n vectors. And the central basis for the space of like matrices, sorry, one by n matrices. The central basis for the space of matrices are matrices with a one in a particular place and zeros everywhere else. And that's exactly what this is. And an important point to emphasize is that this basis is like not canonical. I will elaborate a lot more on what that means later, but basically it's arbitrary. And the reason it's arbitrary is that we chose an inner product in terms of our basis, and inner products give us a lens of looking at the dual. And so that lens depends on the original basis we took. Um, and but in some sense this kind of isn't a problem because when we're doing linear algebra, the way to think about and do everything is to say, I've got a problem, I'm gonna choose a basis that fits the problem really well, and then kind of interpret everything in terms of this basis, as I talked about for an hour in talk one. And so in some sense, this is a this is a feature, not a bug, because we can choose a basis to study V in like a really nice way. And then this gives us a this gives us an arbitrary lens of looking at V dual. We've chosen the lens, so the problem is really nice. And as we saw late, as we'll see later, choosing the right basis for V and looking at the corresponding dual basis basically kills every dual space problem ever. Um, and yeah, the second fundamental idea is the notion of dual maps. So, kind of standard mathsy idea. We've taken each vector space and got a new vector space out. But vector spaces aren't just like Three floating points in the ether. Vector spaces are related to other vector spaces. Like there are functions between them. And so, like, there are linear maps between vector spaces. And so the natural question to ask is: when we take duals, what happens to these functions? And what we really want is for this to be a function between V dual and W dual. Sadly, that's not a thing that actually happens, because if I think about an element of V dual, that's like a map from V to R. And there's not really any sense of way to take a function from V something else, another function from V something else, and get a function from W to something else. But because the kind of these are two heads, and the only two are the functions are when you have a head and a tail together. So let's just cheat a little bit. And instead look at an arrow over here. And now we get a really we get a really simple way of doing things. We can stick f on the front of our function and get a get a map from v to r. And so arrows from v to w reverse direction, but are still kind of cool and interesting linear maps and are still deeply related to f. And this is the second really fundamental idea of studying dual spaces. And 
again, let's look at this through the lens of the inner product and see what happens. So I pick a particular, I'm going to pick a particular thing in WG. So this is a linear map dot with W. So um, now I'm going to figure out what Q of F of B is. So this is W dot F of B. Or you can write the matrix form as W dot with matrix times B. And now this is a matrix on one side of our inner product. And this is a map from B to the real numbers, where you kind of stick A in front of B and then like dot with W and T we get out the end. We can write this in purely matrix form, like this. And now what we're doing is we have a row vector, W transpose A, which you can think of as A transpose W or transpose. And we're dotting B with that. This is obviously an element of W dual. So what we've just done is said that, oh, sorry, this is obviously an element of B dual. So what we've just done is defined a map from W dual to B dual, where the matrix is just A transpose. And that's why the matrix of the dual map is A transpose, because of this deep link to bilinear forms and inner products. You can also show this by just like chasing through the basis in a natural, in like a natural boring way. But I think this is like a much more interesting and deeper link. Um, what's also worth emphasizing here is that whenever I take a transpose, I'm kind of glossing over a subtlety, which is that the transpose is only defined in terms of the basis. And so the key point here is that I'm choosing a basis so my inner product is orthonormal. And only in that case is the transpose in the sense of can swap from this side to this side, the same as the transpose in the sense of I can just reflect in the diagonal. Um, so also worth highlighting is there's a really common exam question, but especially short questions, that's just like, here is a basis. Find the dual basis. Here is another basis. Find the corresponding dual basis. And it's worth noting that all this kind of question is asking you to do is find the change of basis matrix P for this, and then write down what P transpose inverse looks like. And it's worth just keeping in mind that this is a this is like a really, really simple algorithm based on the one you follow, and you can pick up a like five minute meter doing this. And yeah, so there are two key tools to understanding dual spaces. This notion of a dual basis, which is just we have an inner product, think of them as row vectors. And this notion of a dual map, which is just we have a function, stick another function on the end. Or if you prefer a more like basis dependent inner product key notion, it's just write it like this and move the matrix to the other side. So now let's just look at a few of the results that you actually proved in the course and you're expected to like understand the virtual shapes. So idea one, annihilators. So we define an annihilator as the elements of the dual space. Uh, sorry, U is like a particular subspace in my bit space. I define the annihilator as the maps that send everything in my subspace to zero. Why do we care about this? We care about this because in the inner product lens, this is just the kind of what happens when you dot with a vector that's in the orthogonal space to you. This is kind of exactly analogous to the kind of dual thing to you, like the orthogonal bit of you. Because something like something dots with everything that's used to give zero, it can only be orthogonal. So you, the dimension of this is just exactly the same as the dimension of the orthogonal bit to you. And so it's just div v minus div v. You can also think about this by 
taking an orthogonal basis of u and extending it to an orthogonal basis of the entire space, because in the corresponding dual basis, the, the kind of coefficients of all the things that make up u must be zero, because otherwise they'd send a member of u to something non-zero, but all the other things can be whatever. And that's kind of all that's going on with annihilators. And now we're going to do some sort of interesting things. And I want to emphasize again, the key point is always, choose the right basis, everything falls out. So what happens when you take the sum of two spaces and take the annihilator? So this is a result from the course. Why is this actually true? Um, the easy way to see why it's true is just pick a simple basis. We've got two subspaces we care about. So the thing you should always do is, by status, choose a basis of the intersection, um, extend to a basis of u, extend to a basis of b. So the dimension of u is a plus b, the dimension of w is a plus c, the dimension of u intersects w is um, a. And now, and then we can just kind of extend both of these bases to like a basis of the actual space. And now, we can, to study an annihilator in the dual basis, you just say, you pick a base of the space, you take the dual basis of that, and then all of the coefficients of those things must be zero. And that's exactly the same as being in the annihilator. So being in this bit is the same as all of the corresponding coefficients to these being zero. Being in here is like all of these being zero. And being in here is like all of these being zero. So the only way you're in both is if all of them are zero. And like that's why this result is true. Um, exercise to the reader shows that the exact same basis shows that this is true. And you can also interpret this through the um, things that are orthogonal to every vector in u or w are exactly the same as vectors that are orthogonal to everything in u and orthogonal to everything in w. Um, we also get some cool links between looking at images and kernels of dual maps and annihilators of those. So, um, like the kernel of a, the dual map is the annihilator of the image, and the image of the dual map is the annihilator of the kernel. So these are kind of natural results to expect to be true, because these seem really related, and they've got the same dimension. Like, the dimension of this is the same as the dimension of the kernel of t, which is n minus the dimension of the image, which is the same as the dimension of this. And it's so like this is a fairly natural statement. And this just immediately falls out when you choose the correct dual basis. So what's the structure of this problem? We have a particular linear map t we really care about. t has a matrix between two different spaces, v and w. And the way to lay a linear map between two different spaces is to Choose a basis so that the matrix looks like a bunch of ones on the diagonal followed by a bunch of zeros on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. Let's call the basis of this bit like w1 to wa, call this bit the rest of the basis, call this bit v1 to vb, and call the rest of it like the rest of the basis. And now, and now we just kind of all fall out. The image, the basis of the image of T is W1 to WA. So the basis of the annihilator is stuff with non-zero coefficients of the dual basis to these bits. The T star is something that goes from W to V, uh, or W dual to V dual. And so the curl are the bit that gets sent to zero, like this bit. Or this is a basis of the curve. And so they're exactly the same thing. Same implies here. The image are the things that 
the non-zero bits get centered. So they're things with non-zero coefficients of v1 to vb. The kernel of t are it has basis this bit. And so the annihilator has only non-zero coefficients on the rest basis, this bit. And so everything is just, you pick a basis of one point that correspond, the basis of the rest turns out to be the basis of the thing you care about. And the kind of key point to highlight again, everything fell out when we just chose a sensible basis, and the problem was just pretty straightforward. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything I did just there? Cool. So, yeah. So I've pretty much covered what I think you're like, most of what I think you're expected to know about your spaces. I now want to talk for a while about the deeper high-level maths hiding beneath the surface when it comes to dual spaces, and trying to elaborate on some offhand comments the lecture probably made about things like the importance of finite dimension and yeah, the importance of finite dimension and the importance of kind of canonical versus non-canonical isomorphisms, and like just what's really going on with double dual spaces. So first off, um, the fact that we're in finite dimensional spaces is really important, much more important than for a lot of the rest of this course. Why? Because the key point of everything we've done about dual bases is that V is isomorphic to its dual. Um, significantly, they have the same dimension. And this stops being true when you start looking at infinite dimensional spaces. Um, why? I think this is best illustrated by looking at the space of all polynomials. So the space of polynomials of like arbitrary degree. This space, this is a vector space called a counter basis. And a point, a point that's very important to highlight when you're looking at infinite dimensional spaces is that we not, by default, we only define addition for finitely many things. Like we're doing algebra right now. In order to study infinite sums, we need to have notions of convergence and limits and analysis, which aren't things we like dealing with because that's icky and scary to spend hours to deal with. And so the point is, for P, I can take a basis that's just like polynomial, just the monomials. And this is a basis for P because things that I take infinite sums. This is not a polynomial, so it's not in my space. But this doesn't matter because it's an infinite linear combination of terms. The only thing to get out are polynomials, because when you have a finite bunch of terms from this, that's a thing with finite degree, and all polynomials have finite degree. But this is not, but this kind of finite this notion doesn't hold when we're thinking about the dual space. Because if I want a function, from the space of polynomials. Um, if I want a function from the space of polynomials to the reals, then this is a basis. So I define my function by freely acting on that basis. I send each thing to some real number. And I can choose a real number freely for each of these. So I have an infinite sequence of real numbers. And I no, no longer have the constraint that like eventually they're zero, like eventually all the coefficients of the polynomial must be zero. Um, the reason this is fundamentally different from taking a linear combination of the basis is that when I'm taking like a combination of base elements, I'm look, adding things up, I'm looking at them all happening simultaneously. My function looks at a particular input and gives a particular output. There's, there isn't the same like ickiness of convergence and infinite things not being allowed. I have to define my function on each of these base elements. And so the space I get out at the end is something that looks like r to the like r to the positive integers. And this is a bigger space than that. I'm not gonna prove that because the proof is part, but like the key idea is just you can kind of prove by a diagonalization argument that you cannot have a countable basis of this because you have so many degrees of freedom 
you can choose something which just can't be achieved by any finite linear combination. Um, and yeah, if you're mildly insane, you can do interesting things like define a finite dimensional vector space as just being an infinite linear combination. As uh, sorry, define a finite vector dimensional vector space as something which is isomorphic to its dual, because the idea is that for every infinite dimensional space, this isomorphism is not true. Um, a slight caveat for people who have seen things like quantum mechanics and detail of Hilbert spaces is that the statement V is not isomorphic to its dual for an infinite dimensional space only works for kind of vanilla vector spaces. When you start adding weird shit like topologies and convergence and norms like you do with Hilbert spaces, this doesn't apply. And it's a really important result in quantum mechanics that a vector space is that a Hilbert space is always isomorphic to its dual. And they gloss over that really nicely in quantum principles of quantum mechanics. Um, and so all of this stuff about, um, so going back to vanilla vector spaces, all of this stuff about V is not isomorphic to its dual um, when it's infinite, but is when it's finite, is actually important for the stuff you do in the course, like just understanding finite spaces better. Why? Because I think normally when I try and think intuitively about Lin algebra, I don't really address the fact that it's a finite dimensional vector space. Um, I don't address the fact that there's a finite basis. That's not a thing which really appears in my intuition. I'm just kind of reasoning about maps and inputs and what do I do with things. I'm kind of reasoning at a very local level. While finite dimension is a global property, it's telling me there's a the number of degrees of freedom I have is finite and it's constrained. And when you're thinking about particular vectors and particular functions and particular inputs, you don't really notice this global structure of being finite dimensional. And so things will just go really wrong a lot of the time. And so the only way you can solve problems is by finding a way to use the fact that it's finite dimensional. And I think the two key ways of doing this are you want to show that two things are the same space. So you show that one is a subset of the other, and then you show they have the same dimension, because dimension is a global property that uses the total degrees of freedom. Or you choose a dual basis, because actually choosing a basis kind of quantifies the amount of degrees of freedom you have. So, for example, um, one of the results I proved previously that the image of T dual is the annihilation of the kernel. Um, is not actually true in infinite dimensional spaces. And so if you just approach this naively and say, I want to show two spaces are equal, show left subset of right, right subset of left, done. You're going to fail because this is a subset of this by just definition chasing. But this is not a subset, like this is not a subset of this in the infinite dimensional case. And so you have to prove this result by looking at dimension or choosing a basis. And so if you ever tried just doing this naively, where you try and show one as a subset of the other, that's why things broke, because it's not true in the infinite case. And so you need to use the fact that it's finite dimension. And that's a second reason why I kind of really heavily emphasized this notion of like take the dual basis, because you just get the finiteness for free. And that lets you think about it nicely. Um, and the final point I want to talk about dual spaces is this notion of there not being a canonical isomorphism and trying to unpack both what that really means and what the deep map applies to services for the hardest and most abstract section of the talk. So, like, don't feel bad if I lose you, but please do ask if anything I say doesn't feel clear. Because I think there's really, really cool ideas hiding in the surface here. Hey, Lenny. Um, so, okay, so, click. There is no canonical isomorphism from B to its dual. So first off, what does the word canonical even mean? The word canonical means non-arbitrary, which means kind of can you find a map where you're not making any arbitrary choices? Um, this is a really hard thing to like actually reason about or prove anything about. So the case I'm going to try and make is that this is not actually like a very well-posed question. 
Um, but it's, there is like intuitive truth. Why is there intuitive truth? Um, the most compelling argument I know about on an intuitive level why there isn't a canonical isomorphism is that the way to understand an isomorphism is by looking at an inner product or a bilinear form. And so this is exactly the same as saying there is no canonical inner product in space. And like we know that's true. Um, I tried to make that point using polynomials earlier. Um, another setting where that point, I think, becomes a lot clearer is in the geometry course. Because when you look at a Riemannian metric, you're defining a different inner product at each point in space, because an inner product is a notion of distance. And so the point Riemannian metrics in the geometry course are trying to make is that the notion of distance is an arbitrary thing we impose on the space. For example, a metric is plane, and I take like an ellipse. This looks like an ellipse because I'm thinking of this as like the standard Cartesian plane. But I can actually instead like give a scale that's twice as big on the y-axis. And now this ellipse is my unit circle. The notion of the distance and what the unit circle and what things really mean is just an arbitrary thing I impose on the space. And like that's what it means to say that inner product is arbitrary. And that's what it means to say that maps from B to its dual are arbitrary. Um, I want to emphasize again that I am not asserting that I proved this notion. I don't think you really can prove this notion. But there, like the intuition here is that inner products are arbitrary. They're the same as an inner product. And so such isoms are arbitrary. Um, but now I want to try and like dig a bit deeper into what things that are canonical really mean. Like studying an example of something that is canonical and try and think about what makes that so interesting and special. And the example I'm going to go with is mapping a vector space to its product of itself. So I think that there is a canonical map here. It's not an isomorphism, but the isomorphism part isn't super important. There is a canonical map where I don't need to, need to make any arbitrary choices because I can ascend a vector w to w paired with itself. And like this is just the obvious thing to do, right? I haven't made any arbitrary choices. But I think a deeper read, so I would call this a canonical map for any vector space. But I think the like deeper reason behind why this is canonical, where shit like this wasn't, is that the actually important thing with vector spaces are, is the structure, the maps between different vector spaces. And the beauty of this map is it preserves that structure. Like, if I have two vector spaces, like B and W, and a linear map between them, and I look at B cross B to W cross W, there is like a map F cross F in like a really lovely and canonical way that just sends like, um, that just sends A, B to F of A, F of B. And why is these, why are these arrows, why are just the pairing arrows, like canonical maps? They're canonical maps because it doesn't matter whether I apply a function from in my vector spaces and then pair things up, or if I pair things up and then apply a function in vector spaces, I get the same output. Like if I pick a vector here and trace it through, I get f of b, f of b over here. And if I show up here, I get vb and the same output done. And so the deeper thing going on here, why I think it's actually right to call this canonical, is that the, stru the like structure of my space is preserved. And if I took like a non-vector space, x, and took another function g, this has a composition, um, uh, g composed with f, and you get exactly the same structure on these like corresponding functions over here. Like there's a corresponding d cross d, which compose to a like d of f cross g of f function. And so like the deeper reason, the deepest thing happening when we talk about things being canonical and non-arbitrary is that they preserve structure. And then that's the thing we actually care about is this structure. Because with a vector space, the thing we really care about is like the ability to add and scale. Many maps are maps that preserve addition and scaling. And so the thing the thing we care about
care about is preserved by all of these. And so if the thing we care about has a corresponding thing we care about over here, it should also be preserved by functions. Um, there, yeah, did that kind of make sense from an intuitive level to people? Like, we care about structure. Things are canonical if they preserve structure. So, um, now let's return to the context of dual disks. So, as I said at the start of this section, the, the statement, there is no canonical isomorphism, I think is a badly posed question because it, it leads you thinking like, how do I know there's no canonical isomorphism? Have I looked hard enough? Maybe there's one behind the sofa if I like really crane my neck. But I don't think that this is like a good mindset because knowing that structure vanishes isn't interesting. When we're doing maths, we care about structure, so we want to see what happens in the structure. And we know what happens to structure when we look at dual spaces. Things reverse direction. Um, like, if I have, a, like, vector spaces and composition, then, like, if I look at the dual things, I get dual things. And here, the kind of order of composition reverses, but like the dual of G composed, G composed with F is F dual composed with G dual. And so the right, the right point to make is not my structure has vanished. There's not a canonical isomorphism. The right point to make is that my structure, my structure still exists. It's just been transformed, everything's changed direction. And like that's the actual interesting thing happening here. It's there's not a canonical isomorphism because the natural interpretation of structure is not the same structure I started with, but it's still like an interesting and deep structure. And this is kind of illustrated by just the fact that linear maps, uh, the dual maps are transposes, because if I transpose, the two matrices kind of convert like the way around they are steps. Um, and like that's what happened here. Things kind of change direction. And yeah, this also helps us think about double duals. So double dual is like the star star. So I kind of so like this is a really weird object. This is linear maps from the space of linear maps from B to R to R. And like, what? Um, but if we think about them through this kind of picture on our head of like arrows and structure, the arrows reverse the first time we apply the star. And they reverse again the second time we apply it. So the arrows are all pointing in the same direction they started with. So in double dual spaces, the structure is preserved. And we see that there is a canonical isomorphism. The interesting point is that there is a way to interpret our structure on the original space in exactly the same way on the double dual spaces. Um, we get a we get like a particular non-arbitrary, i.e., canonical map of like B mapping to the evaluated B, like the thing which takes in a dual vector and sends it to like F evaluated at B, um, but I think that the fact that this exists is like fun, but it's not the point. We should kind of expect there to be something like this because all of our structure is preserved. This just happens to be the instantiation of that. Like the structure is like the deeper maps of that. And so kind of focusing a bit more on double jewels specifically. The left, like high level math lesson to take from double duals and the fact that this exists is that the way to understand weird abstract shit, like L of L of B of R R, like what, is by taking an isomorphism to think we do understand well, so B, and the evaluation the evaluator B map is nice because it just lets you do that. Um, through my inner product methods, I can think about the like dual like dual spaces as m move B from the right to the left of the inner products. And so the double dual space is just move it around twice. 
um, like if B maps to stick B on the left, then this maps to just like what happens when you swap something twice, which you can think of as being B. Um, and yeah, so a bunch of results, like the results you get for dual, double duals, like that the annihilator of the annihilator is isomorphic to the original space. Um, you can, like, you should probably prove them by using the particular association. But the kind of deeper, deeper idea is just the idea of taking a dual is this operation that perfectly reverses. And yeah, did kind of all of that abstract nonsense about structure make sense to people? Any questions? Um, cool. So this is actually. Um, so the reason I really, really like dual spaces, and I really like all of this stuff, is this touches on much deeper and more interesting parts of maths than basically anything else that the math course does. Because uh, basically everything I've just done was an area of maths called category theory. So what maths is really about on a fundamental level, in my opinion, is studying structures, like studying functions between things and how they compose and how all these things kind of flow together and map together. And in like loads of different areas of maths, you get things like s maps between things, like um, group homomorphisms, ring homomorphisms, continuous functional topological spaces, linear maps between vector spaces. And category theory is all about taking kind of ideas about structure, so ideas that don't depend on exactly what these maps and objects are, and just studying those in the abstract we can understand them when they come up in the world. And the kind of idea here of things where maps reverse is called a contravariant functor, and it's just an object you will study in category theory. And the right way to think about all that is just, it naturally comes up in a bunch of settings like dual spaces. And uh, so to be clear, a contravariant functor is something where like, when you take a composition and you think about what functions correspond to, like you go from spaces to dual spaces, um, the order of composition reverses. And this idea of like arrows change direction, structure's kind of preserved but altered in a way that's really reversible, actually comes up a lot. So it came up with transposes here and dual spaces, but it also comes up when we're looking at inverse maps, like where well, my picture is, B to W goes to like just the same the same things, but now I have an, the inverse map. And this like notion appears exactly appears there. Like the inverse of F composed with G is G inverse composed with F inverse. And if we look at right group actions, the same thing arises. We are taking like the function. Um, we're taking the function like right group action G, then right group action H on X, which look so really this is um, G on the right H on the right, and this is really annoying because the order of composition reverses. Like I go from H G to G H, and Studying this from a category theoretic lens, this is just exactly the same notion as dual spaces. Like, you can think of multiplying two elements together as like applying a function, and that reverses direction. Um, or let's take another, let's take a kind of cooler and weirder example. Um, I want to study continuous functions between two topological spaces. So f between like t and u. These are both sets with a topology, and continuous functions are kind of the structure preserving maps for topological spaces, because the structure of a topological space is like the open sets. And so what I want to say is, I can interpret the topology on t, like an open set in t, as an open set in u. Sadly, I can't actually do this. That's not how continuous maps work. Continuous maps correspond to like, if u, if O is an open set of U, then the pre-image of O in T 
is an open set of T. And so F inverse kind of naturally defines a map between the open sets of U and the open sets of T. And you can show that if you take like a bunch of topological spaces and a bunch of continuous maps and you take the compositions, that when you kind of look at what happens to the open sets and take pre-images, the order of composition reverses. And the high level point I'm trying to make, I'll emphasize again, is that what everything we've done here was just an example of this particular structure of we transform functions and the order reverses. And this comes up all over the place in maths. Like there are a bunch of examples that I couldn't really give because they wouldn't even make sense to people in the room. And Caffrey theory, which is one of my favorite areas of maths, is really, really cool. Uh, this is basically sales pitch going to the 4K Caffrey theory course. It's all about abstracting out these structures and just studying them and really understanding them, and then seeing how they come up in maths and just like understanding them in those contexts. And so just to recap what I think the two actually important ideas in all of that spiel were, um, finite versus infinite dimensional is really important with dual spaces. And our intuition kind of breaks a bit because finite dimensional thing, because dual spaces are isomorphic to the finite dimensional, they're not infinite dimensional. And so for all the proofs, they're only true in the finite dimensional case. So we need to use the fact that it's finite dimensional when we're thinking about them, and this is hard. And the way to do this is doing things like looking at dimension or taking a basis, because otherwise finite dimensional doesn't really appear in our intuition. And the second point is that the statement there is no canonical isomorphism between V and its dual is like not a well-proposed statement. The actual like deeper statement behind that is the way to interpret the structure on V as structure on V dual is different. It's not the same as it looks like on V because all the arrows reverse direction. But if you apply this twice, you get the same structure out, and that's why double dual spaces are nice. Um, so you can find these two ideas. If you look at double dual spaces in the infinite dimensional case, you actually get a canonical map, like mapping V to the evaluated V map is still like a canonical, non-arbitrary, basis-free idea, and it's still preserves all the structure. It's just not an isomorphism, mm -hmm. because the double dual space is too big. Um, I'm going to take a one minute break and then launch into the final chapter. Um, this chapter is extremely modular, so I can like actually end on time by just cutting out bits at the end. Um, the next chapter is just going to be about basically just going through, I think, a bunch of the like, deeper and more interesting theorems that don't really fit into the structure of my talk, and just trying to break on the proof on an intuitive level, and both explain how I can remember it for the exam, and also like what's actually going on there. Um, any questions on that section? Is there a toilet there? Yes. Just go out the Go out the door, go out the double doors, they'll be like, okay, I'll give you a rest for some points. What? For what? What? Is the recording going okay? Cool. Can I tell you? Cool. Cool, gonna be in time. Sorry, Lenny. Can I just wait to see how it's here and I keep talking for shit? So, chapter seven. Bonus <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, sort of this is basically going to be here's a bunch of like interesting, important theorems. Here's how to think about theorems with the important bits, which actually go. Theorem 1. Um, if A and B commute and are diagonalizable, there's a common eigenbasis. So this is like a really important and deep result when you're doing quantum mechanics, because eigenstates of an operator, like eigenstates of an operator correspond to like things which have a like known physical quantity. Like eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are things where you know what the energy is, like there's no uncertainty there. And this tells me that if I have two things that commute, 
then I can choose a basis where I know both of those things exactly. Like when you start doing hydrogen atom in the second year of general course, for anyone who got to that point in the 10th lectures, um, the, the fact that the Hamiltonian, the angular momentum operator, and the angular momentum around a particular axial operator commute, that you choose a basis of like things to know all of those things. And the fact that the position of momentum operator don't commute means that you can't do that. Um, uh, there's an if and only if in here, but like the backwards direction is like really, really easy. Um, so why is this true? So for the people who are on previous talk, the kind of really important fundamental key idea behind anything about endomorphisms is you want to pick invariant subspaces. These are diagonalizable, so the invariant subspaces you choose are the eigenspaces. So we just break down my vector space into the sum of like e, it's like the eigenspaces of a, and this is really cool. Um, yeah, and a is just scaling by lambda on each of these things. And cute trick, if I take B of um, uh, if I take this space, then what I get out is also Y, because a vector is in here, a vector is in here, if and only if AB equals lambda B, which means that the AB equals lambda BB, but they commute, so it's A times BB, so BB is also in there. Um, this is really important because it means that this is an invariant subspace of B. Um, now that the like kind of clever magical part of the proof, we need to know that if a matrix is diagonalizable in general, like it has an eigenbasis um, on the entire space, it also has an eigenbasis on the invariant subspace. And the only way I really know how to do about how to do this is that a matrix is diagonalizable if and only if its minimal polynomial is a product of distinct linear factors. And well, like these are all distinct. And the minimal polynomial on an invariant subspace is just a factor of this, because the minimal polynomial is like where the polynomial of the linear map is zero. If it's zero on the entire space, it's also zero on the smaller space. And so the minimal polynomial of that smaller space divides this. So it's also a product of distinct linear factors. And so the restriction of B to the eigenspace is also diagonalizable. And now we're just done. We, it's diagonalizable, so we can choose an eigenbasis for that. But I think it's worth highlighting that like this is the hard clever bit of the proof. How do you show that restrictions of diagonalizable map are diagonalizable? Because that, that's super non obvious. And yeah, so that is cool theorem number one. Um, cool theorem number two, the spectral theorem. Um, so just to recap, the idea is break it up into eigenspaces, each is invariant. Diagonalizable, restricts diagonalizable, so you can choose an eigenbasis of each eigenspace, which is obviously a common eigenbasis, so we're done. Theorem 2, the spectral theorem. The spectral theorem states that if A is normal, i.e. it commutes with its conjugate transpose, this is equivalent to A has an orthonormal eigenbasis, i.e. it's both diagonalizable and the basis you choose is orthonormal. This is a really, really important theorem because every time you ever have something like symmetric, orthogonal, Hermitian, unitary, whatever, those are just special cases of being a normal matrix. And so the stuff I did earlier when I was like, um, blitzing through the methods course and saying, self joints, we can choose an orthonormal eigenbasis. We will look here what table it is. These were applying the same key ideas to the spectral theorem. Though in the infinite dimensional case, we're proving it's sign wired. But this is like really fundamental. And this is always what you should think whenever you're dealing with a matrix that is normal. And again, the key idea here is choosing invariant subspaces. 
So as I proved last time, every complex endomorphism has eigenvectors. So there's always a V so that A, B is under V. And I want to try and generate an invariant subspace from V. And the kind of key difference here from when I was looking at the Jordan normal form earlier is that I've got an inner product and I know something about how A behaves with that inner product. And so my goal is show that the thing orthogonal to V is invariant. And the key idea for actually showing this is converting being a normal matrix into a nice form. And this is the magic of it. The idea here is that I want to study, if I look at the length of this, that's a b dotted with itself. So I can write this as, I can write this like this. And like, this is kind of the start point to remember, because obviously this is a map we know something about, so we should study it like this. We can move A from either side by kind of 20 bit transpose counts. And we can now swap these two things around. And this is just, so this tells me that the length of AB and the length of A transpose B are the same. Why is this like interesting indeed? This is interesting indeed because it tells me the kernels are the same. Like, these are norms. And norm is zero if and only if the vector is zero. This tells me that the kernel of A equals the kernel of A transpose. And if A is normal, A minus a scalar is also normal. Like, you can just verify this. And so this means that kernel of A minus lambda i is the kernel of the conjugate and so the clever idea here was we want to study eigenspaces the way to always, you should always think about eigenspaces is the kernel of this map this map is also normal by kind of filling this equation and normal matrices are nice because they have this length property which gives you this kernel property and so the kernel of this is the kernel of this. So every eigenspace of A corresponds to an eigenspace of A transpose, but with the eigenvalue is conjugated. And we're now pretty much done because something is in like B per perpendicular. If and only if like this is zero, which implies because it's an eigenvector, like applying A just scales, which doesn't affect the fact that it's perpendicular. And now I can, um, now I can swap this to get this. So A transpose preserves, so this means that this is an A transpose invariant subspace, but I could repeat this exact same argument, but swap a, the roles of A and A transpose because eigenvectors of A are also eigenvectors of A transpose. And so this tells me that this is an A invariant subspace. And so I just choose an eigenvector, restrict to the space perpendicular to it, and just repeat. And like that's all that's going on with that proof. So to recap the key ideas there again. Normal is nice because you can manipulate it into this preserving length form, which gives you preserves kernels. You can apply the next clever idea is subtract a scalar from that, because that still gives you normal matrices. And looking at kernels when you subtract a scalar gives you eigenspaces. This tells me that A and A transpose are both linear map. Um, a and A transpose share eigenspaces. And this lets you manipulate my inner product to show that the thing orthogonal is A invariant. Um, Neil, should you, um, do you have to prove uh, kind of separately that lambda is real? Um, that's only if it's Hermitian. Okay. Not if it's normal in general. Okay. Um, yes. And you. There's a bar I didn't notice. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. And that's yeah. Like you do need to prove that in the Hermitian case, but that's like mm, quite easy if you just think. 
how I prove that. And uh, final theorem we're going to try and squeeze in is Sylvester's law of inertia. I promise. Um, so Sylvester's law of inertia. Um, this says A is symmetric bilinear form, then I can write like I can like choose a new basis so that it looks like a bunch of ones, a bunch of minus ones, and then zeros. And P and Q meet. And unlike most other most of the other theorems of this form, um, both of these bits are like hard. So why can I write it like this? So I'm basically saying I have an inner product, I have a bilinear form, how can I choose an orthonormal basis? So my intuition says obviously I apply ground shift. The problem with applying ground shift is you need a vector that's of non-zero length. And it's not obvious that you have a vector of non-zero length. So, clever idea one. How can I find a vector of non-zero length? Um, well, you just say, pick one of non-zero length. So, the only interesting case is, what if there is not a vector of non-zero length? Like, what if... Now the clever idea is to observe that knowing the lengths of all the vectors exactly reconstructs a bilinear form and vice versa, because of the polarization identity, which says that so like if I know lengths, then I know the inner products and vice versa. And um, this is first off cool because it tells me that if I know a quadratic form, I also know the bilinear form and vice versa. And so this tells me if all the lengths are zero. But I'm done, I'm just at this point. Everything is zero. The entire matrix must be zero. Um, otherwise, I can choose a vector with non-zero length and just apply Gram Schmidt and make that my new basis vector by kind of scaling it so it has unit length, whether plus or minus one, and then um, restrict to the space orthogonal to that. And the reason you get ones or minus ones is that. Whenever I scale a vector, I actually scale the length by, so like the length of lambda v is lambda squared v, or like the absolute value of lambda squared in the Sanitian form. And so like this can only change it in a positive vector. This can't change the sign, it can only change the absolute value. But like that's why you have ones and minus ones. And you can just reorder this orthogonal basis you get to look like this. And next question is, why is it unique? The reason it's unique is, so on an intuitive level, the reason it's unique is that um, like the subspace of the first P things is entirely positive definite. And like you can't do better than that. Because if you had a matrix with like more ones, then you'd have a basis for a positive definite subspace. Because if every basis vector has positive length and are all orthogonal, then all linear combinations also have positive length. Um, this idea breaks though, because if I have like this vector, like this vector plus one of these vectors, like a thing which is a zero plus a thing which is a one, that also has non-zero length. And I could instead stick that in and make that part of the orthogonal basis. So trying to choose that there's like some canonical maximal positive definite subspace breaks. The clever idea is that I'm not actually trying to find the biggest positive definite subspace. I'm trying to find the biggest things that could never be in a positive definite subspace. And every linear combination of the elements in this bit has net that's like zero or negative. And so no positive definite subspace can ever interact with something in here. This is an n minus p dimensional space. And so every positive definite space has a dimension at most p. And that's how you define p in a basis free way. And the same approach applies for q. And that's the point of Sylvester's law of inertia. And um, 
to over on slightly. Um, there's a cool exam relevant trick you can, you can apply for actually doing sort of best of all the best things, because again, that is a favorite exam question. Um, what we want to do is find P transpose, okay, find P so that like A is in this group. And this is kind of annoying because what we really we understand endomorphisms much better. Like we can find jordan law form much more easily. Like we can look at eigenvectors, look at determinants of A minus lambda, lambda I, and everything's like. But you can't apply this to binomial forms. But so this is about symmetric binomial forms. And symmetric matrices do have an orthonormal eigenbasis. And an orthonormal eigenbasis especially, because P inverse equals P transpose. So the bilinear form in this basis is the same as like the endomorphism in this basis. So what you could do is just diagonalize A as an endomorphism, read off the signs of those eigenvalues, and those are going to be the signs you get in this matrix, um, which is sometimes a lot easier. And yeah, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much all for coming. Uh, does anyone have any final questions? Well, also take questions about the analogy generally. It doesn't have to be something I covered in the talk. Uh, cool. Well, thank you much all for coming again. I'm giving a GRM talk on Friday. That will be something more course relevant than this was. Um, hopefully see many of you there.